Perfect. Um, awesome. Super excited to jump into kind of sharing all the systems that we use uh, behind the scenes at Longplay and also that power backbone um, on how we have generated hundreds of billions of dollars in email revenue for DSC e-com brands that we've worked with. And more yeah. importantly, how to make it systematic, scalable, and profitable. Um, Cause there's so much going on as you are all aware in the e-com space these days. And I'm sure we can all um, find, find a lot of appreciation when there's a level of predictability to everything. So excited to jump in and share some of the systems. <laughs> Um, quick background on me. I think Jenny already did a fantastic intro, so I'll keep this part re relatively short. Um, long play. We started off as an email agency, and now we uh, focus on retention lifecycle marketing. We've had um, the opportunity to work with a ton of just amazing brands um, like Dr. Squatch, Overtone, in uh, email, SMS, direct mail, and just working with them on scaling out their retention uh, and scaling out how to actually keep your customers around through email marketing after you've uh, after you've acquired them. And Backbone um, is actually the first email strategy automation tool as well. It's actually going live this week. Um, and uh, that helps DSC e-com brands automate uh, their email calendar planning, email layout creation, and campaign and flow ideation as well. Um, so you kind of see bits and pieces of that um, through our systems as well. So high level, we're thinking about um, all the systems that we use, we're really focusing on building essentially an email marketing machine. Um, and I would really encourage you guys as I'm kind of going through this presentation for you guys to kind of think about how to apply these principles, not just to email marketing, but overall how to build a marketing machine uh, for your company. The first step that we use is making your email calendar kind of that North star for your strategy and project management. Um, obviously most brands who are using it, who are doing email marketing have an email marketing calendar, but most, don't really have a strategic approach to building one that incorporates campaigns, flows, and actually aligns your email strategy to their um, to their marketing and business goals as well. Um, so our email calendar is an important kind of first stage step at uh, setting the stage uh, for how the email marketing goals are going to uh, be played out. Next, we build out our flow pipeline. A lot of plan or a lot of brands are really really underutilizing under um, planning on building out flows, and it's something you should be doing every week, every month, um, definitely every quarter. And the flow pipeline system helps us stay on top of that for every, every D2C e-com brand and actually start prioritizing and uh, driving that forward. Um, email layouts are a third, uh, third system. Really helps to keep strategy and creative just aligned. Um, I'm sure that a lot of entrepreneurs teams have kind of had the experience of starting to build emails and eventually kind of goes down a rabbit hole of third drafts, fourth drafts, things seeming off the mark. Um, and our email layouts keep every email actually converting, high performing and also on brand as well. Um, then we leverage our A-B testing methodology. And this one we do a little bit differently um, than most agencies and also most in-house teams. And it really helps to drive insights that actually not just improve your email marketing performance, but also your overall marketing and business performance as well. Um, and that's one of the most important systems that we use at, to scale D2C e-com brands. Um, next is using your using reporting to actually turn your data into insights. Um, a lot of brands underutilize their, their dashboards to actually drive strategy forward. Um, so that's an important part in actually not just getting information, getting reporting, and getting all the analytics, but how do you actually turn those analytics into information and how do you use it to actually pivot into your strategy as well? And lastly, our project management workflow kind of keeps everything going, especially as you scale a D2C e-com brand, you can be producing, you know, hundreds of emails um, a month. We, we definitely do a working across a lot of different brands. Um, so that project management workflow is really important to not just produce more emails, but also keep that quality going as well. And also free up your team to work on other marketing initiatives. So I'm going to run through each of these systems um, and Full, uh, full disclosure, there's a lot of like meat in the in the deck, so feel free to take screenshots and I'll also be sharing the deck afterwards um, just through like Twitter DMs. So you can definitely access the deck um, after this as well. All right, so when we're talking about building our machine, we always want to be looking at it in a systematic and also scalable way in the sense where every part of the machine kind of feeds itself and it's kind of a self-perpetuating flow. So we always start off with that email calendar. The email calendar then informs our flow pipeline. Once both of those strategy pieces are set, that's when we go over to email layouts, which help us um, es essentially execute on the strategy through creative. Then we leverage our A-B testing methodology to improve all of our email content. 
We leveraged our reporting dashboard to get some of those insights on how performance went. And then that feeds back into our strategy and our email calendar and building our flow pipeline as well. So it's a self-perpetuating system. And our, and our project management workflow essentially keeps all of that going. Um, that's a sign of a good machine. It's all self-perpetuating. It all feeds itself. And we're running through it every week, every month, every quarter. First thing, uh, your email calendar. So again, your email calendar is that North Star that's aligning strategy and project management. Um, a lot of the time, people manage email marketing um, kind of ad hoc. Um, so typically, we're seeing brands come in where you know email is kind of being planned last minute when there's a new promotion, when there's a new product launch happening, but there's no one really having the space to kind of sit down and look at how email strategically fits into your business and also how you're going to execute on that strategy as well. So when we're looking at an effective email calendar, essentially there's a few kind of quick, quick checkpoints um, just to make, just check if your email calendar is really as effective as it can be in moving your business forward. The first is your email calendar should have both flow, campaigns and flows. Um, most email calendars are just campaigns. So a lot of brands spend time on promotions, product launches, newsletters, and things like that. When really, especially early on into uh, a D2C e-com journey, your flows are probably an even more important area to spend your time on. So you really should be spending 10 to 15% of your revenue on flows and, um, and having a mix of both campaigns and flows in your email calendar each month as well. Second, it should always have a mix of kind of sales and nurture emails and also new and also proven ideas. So what I mean by that is you should have emails in there that are pushing products, pushing collections, maybe things like product roundups, things like that. You should also have some nurture emails and that might be as simple as telling your brand story or sharing blog posts that you have on your site, um, sharing tips for how, uh, you know, how someone can take care of like their skin in the summer, things like that, that is really about delivering value back to, back to your customer on topics that they're really gonna care about. And then also you should have a mix of new ideas where it's like, hey, let's swing for the fences, let's test these new, new creatives, new messaging, new content, and also some proven ideas um, around like uh, product roundups that have always worked or testimonial emails that have always worked. Um, and you kind of want to approach it almost like kind of top of funnel ad creative, right? You always have a mixture of like retargeting, acquisition, you also have new creatives and, you know, the proven ads that have always worked, You're kind of approaching the same way when it comes to building your email calendar. Uh, third is having campaigns and flows strategic to your business goals. So not just seasonal promotions and product launches, but also campaigns that are specifically built to, you know, increase average order value or get more customers buying from bundles or, you know, increase your subscription upsell, right? Things like that. Um, and testing different types of messaging, because at the end of the day, those are the scalable, sustainable strategies that's actually going to continuously push your business forward rather than just, you know, one campaign after the other that isn't really, um, you know, tying together in the customer journey. And lastly, um, really incorporating seasonality. We have seen so, so much success in just leveraging all things seasonality, even if it's simple things like national, like hot chocolate day, if it's relevant to the brand or like national pet day or national dog day, um, but also seasonal tips. So I kind of brought up the example of like summer skin tips. If you're, uh, if you're a skincare company um, is a great example, things like that always do well. So sometimes we'll have, have content such as like, you know, vet tips for, for your dog um, as you're transitioning to the winter, or like how to take care of your, um, of your hair um, when you're traveling. Tips like that that are really relevant to specifically what your customer base is probably going through at that time of the year keeps things relevant and also kind of ties your product um, to, to the pain points that they're naturally having um, throughout the year as well. It also just helps mix up the email calendar. So those are usually the four checkpoints that we're looking for as our team builds email calendars for, for D2C e-com brands. If you have these four, you're usually in a pretty good, pretty good place uh, strategically for your email calendar. Next, this is probably one of my favorite approaches that we kind of built very early on um, with, with long play is this kind of rock, pebble, sand approach. Um, it's it's a, kind of a productivity system uh, originally where the idea is if you had a jar, you had to fill it up with everything and you had rocks, pebbles, and sand. If you filled it up with all sand first, then you would just have no room for the rocks. So you always want to put in the big rocks first, your pebbles second, and then your sand. So you're prioritizing things properly. And we're essentially bringing this approach to email calendar planning. So your rocks are gonna be like your big initiatives. Like for example, you're launching a new loyalty program, um, things that like are immovable. It's on your marketing calendar, it just has to happen this month. Um, but that, that also includes any big promotions, product launches, any big like seasonal campaigns as well, like back to school, 
campaigns and things like that. Those are your rocks. Those are the things that have to happen that month. Um, and we always put those rocks in first and then plan out, for example, if we're running a promotion for 4th of July, let's plan out all the emails that we need uh, for that big promotion first. And then we can move over to pebbles and sand. Um, so put in your rocks first. From there, put in your pebbles, which are anything that our campaigns are around goals. So I talked about earlier around like campaigns that help with um, increasing your subscription upsell rate uh, or cross-selling a very specific product that you might have. Um, so campaigns like that, you want to make sure your business goals are prioritized. You want to add in flows um, as well at that time. And make sure you're always working on flows every single month. And that's also when you can start layering in uh, emails to push specific products that do really well at that time of the year, content emails and things like that. And then lastly, we have kind of have our sand, which is essentially like a swing for the fences, new ideas. This is the time to look for inspo, try new things. Um, one thing that we love to do is take a look at what's really working well on the ad creative side and kind of put a spin to it on the email side um, and things like that. So that's really where uh, your team can have a little bit more fun and, and try out new ideas. But this is a very methodical approach to make sure that your big business goals are taken care of, your big promotions, product launches, and, and things like that are taken care of. You also have flows in there. But there's also a good mix of different types of campaigns as well. Um, and this is kind of a quick guide just on setting your monthly quota. We're a huge fan of using monthly quotas each month. Um, and again, it kind of keeps your strategy and your PM uh, very aligned because we always say like, if you can't, the best strategy in the world if it can't be executed on is not a great strategy. So your monthly quota essentially sets the number of emails that you're going to be creating each month. The number of emails can get then get distributed between campaigns or flows. So if you know that your team only has the bandwidth to produce 10 emails each month, then you know that maybe you have like six campaigns to work with and four flow emails that, that month to work with. And as you guys are scaling up your D2C econ brand, you should be scaling up the quantity of emails as well, not just campaigns, but also flows. Because at that point, you should be segmenting your flows more, building out more flows, extending them, A-B testing, optimizing, all of that fun stuff that we'll kind of get to uh, get to in a second. Um, this is just a quick guide um, that you guys can grab a screen screenshot of to help plan out where you guys should be at and aiming for when it comes to how many emails you're sending out each month in, uh, on the campaign side and how many you're producing on the flow side based off of your uh, business's annual revenue. Next, uh, never stop working on flows. If there's one takeaway from this whole thing, it is don't stop working on flows. Um, there should always be some level of flow work happening in the beginning with with most DTC econ brands, you're probably just gonna be focusing on building out new flows. So getting your welcome flows in, abandoning carts, things like that. But once that's done, it's all about extending them, optimizing them, A-B testing them. A lot, of, um, a lot of important work to do to continue generating revenue. So this is our map of an, essentially an automated customer journey for all DTC econ brands. Um, so any brand, coming in should most of the time need almost all these flows. The only exceptions are like, obviously, if you don't have subscriptions, you won't need subscription flows, or if you're not a CPG product, you don't need replenishment flows. But this is a high level map of all uh, all the key, key flows that you should be, should be needing. And essentially, we want to look at flows um, high level um, by looking at your customer journey. So essentially, how we approach this is we break our customer journey into three different sections. The first is going to be the awareness section. This is kind of like the area when uh, customers are kind of learning about your brand for the first time. So, you know, they found you on a Facebook ad or TikTok ad. They've come to your website and they've joined your list, um, but they haven't really made a purchase yet. So that's when we're targeting thing, them with things like the welcome flow. Um, if you have a quiz, having a separate welcome flow for that always works a little bit better. And then you also want your triad of what we call your buyer intent flows. So your buyer intent flows are essentially flows that um, are targeting customers who have shown some sort of intent to buy. Um, your browse abandonment flow is going to be targeting customers who have viewed a product on site but haven't purchased. Um, your add to cart is targeting customers who have added a product to cart. And then your abandoned cart is targeting customers who've started checkout. The add to cart one is the most commonly missed one that we've seen with most Shopify stores just because of the way Shopify is set up. So essentially with, uh, with Shopify and Klaviyo, which is probably the tech stack most of you guys are using, um, if they start checkout, um, they get your abandoned cart flow. But even if they have products in cart, but they don't start checkout, um, they don't get any sort of flow unless you build this add to cart. So this is, um, again, one of the most important ones that are often missed in most e-com brands. And I will say with the add to cart flow, we've seen a lot of success with it, especially with like brands like 
fashion, apparel, beauty, things like that, where there's a lot of like options. And we find people sometimes use their cart um, as like a wish list, like shopping list. I know I do. Like I'll just browse through a store page, add all the things that I'm interested in, and then I'll kind of sort through my cart later. So those types of brands, especially add to cart flows are usually pretty big. And then you also have your discount offer, which we kind of internally call like a Hail Mary flow, which is essentially, you know, these people have gone through your whole welcome flow. You know, they've probably been on your list for 30 days, 45 days, maybe 60 days, and they're really still not converting. What is the most aggressive offer you can give them to at least break even, get them to experience your product for the first time? And then we can, we can focus on getting those repeat purchases later. So the, the, those all, all those flows target that awareness section, uh, which is really about getting your customer to that first purchase. Secondly, is this whole like customer section, which is essentially right after they make an order and it's still in that like honeymoon period. So you really want to make sure you're starting to nurture them. Um, we really encourage you guys to have different uh, flows for your post-purchase nurture. And also if you have subscription, having a separate flow for that as well, because those customers need to be nurtured slightly differently. Um, and that's one of the areas that we find most e-com brands miss the most is nurturing their customers immediately afterwards. Um, a lot of brands don't nurture until they're ready for a customer to be cross-sold or they need to win back a customer. But I always say like, if you have a friend who only texts you when they need something um, and they kind of ghost you after that, you're not going to be like, that. This isn't, this isn't great. This isn't a great relationship. Um, and your post-purchase nurture essentially serves that same, same purpose as like, hey, we finally got that purchase from you, but like we still appreciate our relationship. This is the time to uh, prevent buyer's remorse educate them on how to use your product, make sure they actually get value out of your product. Um, so sending things like usage guidelines, what to expect, even still additional testimonials, things like that um, is huge. And even just content emails as well. And then from there, you can start lightly cross-selling them or upselling them to a sub subscription as well. And this is when you're trying to get um, those, those repeat purchases. Lastly, you have your whole kind of retention section. This is all about six, 12, 18 month lifetime value. Um, the expected date of next order flow is kind of leveraging predictive analytics um, on Klaviyo um, that works really well. Um, there's also apps like Rello, Repeat that do extremely well um, with getting some of those repeat orders and, and being strategic with the timing of it. Um, so any sort of CPG brand where it's, you know, you have that consumable piece of things, um, making sure you have that expected date of next order, you're leveraging predictive analytics, and you're also uh, leveraging a replenishment flow um, as well to get them to reorder. Subscription churn reduction is also one of the flows that we often see missed a lot. Um, when a customer comes on to subscribe, yes, we want to keep them on the subscription. Um, and sometimes we want to over email them, but we also do still want to communicate with them. Um, so a subscription churn reduction flow can looks very different for every brand, but things that work really well are often like anniversary milestones, um, even just reminding them that they could pause or like change their timing or change the order if they need to, um, sharing even more content and even doing some light cross-selling to, to get them to add additional products to, to their subscription as well. Um, that type of churn reduction really helps like build that loyalty and also obviously reduce uh, cancellations as well. And lastly, you have all of your win back flows here. Um, again, slightly different win backs for people who are on a subscription versus just kind of one-time buyers. Um, but we always say your win back should come last in the sense where let's try to not lose them before we try to win them back um, because that's going to be a lot easier it's a lot always a lot easier to retain a customer than to win them back or try to acquire a new one um, so we want to kind of build along this customer journey and i'd say from a priority standpoint it's typically welcome flow browse add to cart abandoned cart are your kind of your top view uh post purchase nurture cross sell replenishment and like win back um, those are usually the top you know six or seven flows that will move the needle the most initially um, for any D2C e-com brand.